Hello there. Thank you for joining us today. As you're coming in the webinar room, we want to welcome you. My name is Marsha Butler. I am the webinar director here at Advice Chaser. Before we introduce our guest and get started, I need to do a bit of legal housekeeping. Advice Chaser, the host of this webinar, is not a registered investment advisor. We cannot and do not give financial advice. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only and cannot be considered advice for any person's individual situation. Advice Chaser regularly hosts informative webinars, such as this one featuring a variety of knowledgeable professionals, many of whom are licensed advisors. Any opinions, ideas, jokes, or principles expressed by presenters are their own, and however true, funny, or interesting are not endorsed by Advice Chaser. Please do not act on the information you hear today without consulting a qualified financial professional. We're thrilled to bring you today's educational presentation. A couple of notes to you, our attendees. Uh, you are on mute, but we do encourage you to ask questions using the chat box. And that's a feature I do need to turn on. So let me go ahead and turn that on right now. Just a second. Okay, that's turned on. So if you have a question or a comment, go ahead and leave that in the chat box. And the presenter will address those queries during or after the presentation today as appropriate. And if you ask a question in the chat box, go ahead and leave your contact information as well, especially if we can't get to your question during today's event. We'll make sure someone reaches out to you afterwards, um, and we welcome your thoughts as well. We want this experience to be as educational as possible, so please don't hesitate to ask for clarification or expansion of the material. I'd love to introduce you to our presenter today. Let me get his picture up. There we are. Brandon Baltzell helps individuals, households, and business owners identify and strive to achieve their short and long-term lifestyle and financial goals through customized financial planning. Brandon brings his dynamic background, including his formal economics education, investment experience and consulting experience to bear in helping his clients feel confident in their financial futures. And Brandon, we're very excited to have you here today, and I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to you. Thank you, Marche, and thank you all for joining today. I'm so excited to be here with you. Um, as you saw on the last slide, I'm with Axix Financial. We're a boutique financial planning firm based out of Salt Lake City, and we specialize and thrive in working with business owners to help them meet their goals. Um, today, we're talking about something that comes up in a lot of our client meetings, and I really conceptualized this educational webinar as a conversation that we have with a typical business owner that comes in and meets with us. So as we walk through the slides today, I want you to imagine that you are a, a new business owner coming in and having a conversation. And what we want to talk about is how your needs evolve over time. One of the great things about being a business owner is that it opens up a world of opportunities in terms of uh, ways to uh, be intentional about how you pay taxes and opportunities to save money on taxes. And that includes uh, the retirement plan accounts that advisors can set up for you. Um, for individuals, uh, retirement plan options are, are usually pretty limited. Um, in many cases, it's restricted to whatever your employer has set up for you uh, in terms of a 401k. Uh, maybe there are some other options available just depending on how their employer set up their plan. Um, but otherwise, you know, the individual retirement accounts are pretty restrictive in how much you can contribute. So for a typical wage earning employee, uh, a traditional IRA contribution is limited to $6,500 in 2023. We'll show and walk through how for a business owner, not only can you far exceed that limit on your contributions, but you can also set up plans to really maximize how much you're contributing into tax deferred uh, retirement accounts, which can be a huge savings now and in the future. One of the considerations, you know, when you're evaluating whether and how to set up a retirement plan is, you know, what are the goals for you as an individual and for your company? 
And so these bullets illustrate some of the things that our clients weigh when they come into a meeting with us and uh, are, are thinking about, you know, specifically how as a business owner, they, do they reduce their taxable burden in a given year? And so by setting up certain retirement plans, we can be intentional about what they're paying in taxes now and in the future. When we sit down with a client and specifically business owners, uh, some of the first questions we're going to ask is, uh, where did you, how did you start your business? How did things start out? Where are you now with your business and where do you want to go in the future? So we want to have a clear understanding of the trajectory of your business. Um, some business owners are sole proprietorships, uh, maybe they're consultants or realtors, and they're going to be one person businesses into the future. And so that's going to have very different considerations than someone who plans on growing and scaling their business. Uh, this conversation is helpful to uh, both of those extremes. You know, we, we're going to be able to offer some tips today that are things you can, should consider if you're going to be a one-person operation um, forever. But we also want to talk about how to think about your business if you intend to scale up in the future and bring on employees to make sure that you're prepared to grow and scale. Um, I do want to mention this is a high-level conversation. We only have 30 minutes today. We're not going to be able to get into a lot of details of specific cases, but I, I did want to try to illustrate the considerations you're going to have as you grow and evolve your business. So we're going to scratch the surface, talk really high level. If you do have specific questions about uh, your situation, please engage a, a, a financial professional to have that discussion uh, Marche and Advice Chaser can put you in touch with someone who's qualified to have those discussions with you. One of the first things that we look at when we're talking about the advantages of uh, opening or starting your own business is you get to control not only how much you contribute as an employee, but those contributions and those matching uh, opportunities that you have typically as an employee. Uh, once you're the business owner, you get to take advantage of those uh, matching opportunities as well. And you get to choose, you know, how much do you put into the employer's contribution side of a plan? And the IRS limits on employer side contributions, as you'll see in later slides, are much higher than what an individual employee can contribute to their own tax advantage retirement account. When we bring in a new client and they've just started their business, there's a series of operations that we're looking at, uh, and this kind of lists out um, a sequence, if you will, of a hypothetical business owner who's coming in, just starting out as a sole proprietor. They've uh, you know, registered their LLC with the state. They're excited to start up their business, and uh, you know they've got questions about where to go next. So we're going to go through that series of steps and then what that business owner might do in subsequent years as well. And please, you know, I think Marcia already mentioned this, feel free to ask questions in the chat as we go along. Happy to make this interactive and, and answer any of your questions that you have about this process. Before we launch into S Corp, um, we didn't put LLC on there, but can you talk about like uh, what kind of that basic LLC looks like usually, and then talk about the threshold that would get you over to doing this next step? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so when you start out a business, uh, you don't necessarily need to uh, create an LLC, but by creating an LLC, uh, that gives you an opportunity to uh, elect uh, to be uh, considered an S corporation by the IRS. So once we've had a discussion, once you've had a discussion with an advisor and you've identified that there might be an opportunity to um, be really intentional about uh, how you're structuring your business, they may determine uh, that an S corporation election is a good option for you. In which case, uh, if you haven't already, they'll encourage you to establish an LLC. They'll encourage you to have your income directed to that LLC. Uh, and then uh, one of the great advantages of being a business owner is uh, you can choose what you pay yourself as a wage. And the reason that that's important is because if you derive all of your business revenue and then 
have it pass through to your individual um, tax return, then you're going to be paying not only state and federal income tax on that income, but you're also uh, obligated to pay all of the FICA and Medicare taxes, which amount to 15.3% for most people on all of your net business income that passes through to your uh, personal tax return. By electing as an S corporation, you can determine what the IRS deems or, or um, the way the IRS puts it is it's you can determine what is a reasonable salary for the work that you're doing within that company and pay yourself that as a W-2. And when you do that, and I strongly encourage you to work with a CPA to determine what is a reasonable salary for you. A lot of times they'll even have a worksheet to help you work that out. Um, you pay the 15.3% FICA and Medicare tax on only that W-2 income. So just as a rough example, if you earned $100,000 as net business income and all of that passed through to you on your uh, personal tax return and you had to pay the 15.3% on that, that's easy math. We're talking about $15,500 or $300 in taxes uh, on that full amount. If instead you were able to pay yourself a reasonable salary as a W-2 of half of that, $50,000, then you actually cut your uh, FICA and Medicare tax bill in half. You only paid the you know, $76.50 uh, on uh, you know, that tax obligation for that year. Um, this is important because, uh, you know, when you come into this, people may have a conception that there's some way that you can save money on taxes, but you may not have a clear idea of that path forward. A financial advisor, if they work with businesses, they have an idea and they have clients who have done this before and can help you identify if this is a good fit for you. And uh, most of them will also encourage you to talk to a CPA to make sure that you're identifying um, a defensible, reasonable salary. That's an interesting thing. And I'm assuming too, that there are other costs associated with S corps. I believe, don't you have to file an, a, a tax return for the business itself as well? And yeah, know. that's a great, great question, Marche. It does trigger uh, that, you know, you're going to be filing a tax return as the business. Um, there may be an additional preparatory fee for that with your accountant, just depending on the deal you work out with your CPA, you know, whatever their fees happen to be. And they're going to issue a K-1 so that the remainder of that income from your business is going to be business income. And that, again, is why you're not paying FICA and Medicare taxes on that. It's basically earnings from the business that are paid out to you as the owner. All right. And that K-1, how is that taxed? Is it usually... Um, so it still passes through to you. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you're still paying income taxes on that. You're not paying payroll taxes, FICA and uh, Medicare taxes. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Let's sure. go ahead. Let's go ahead and, and move on. So you've gone through the S Corp and then you're in like a stage of growth. Let's talk about this next step. Thanks, Marche. Uh, all right. So business owner comes into us. They've got a new startup. They're a sole proprietor, they have no employees, and in this example, they have 80000 in income after expenses. So they're coming to us and they're saying, look, uh, we know we have over and above the $6,500 limit that we could otherwise put into a traditional IRA. Uh, we've got 12000 in this case that we want to contribute to a retirement account. Uh, what opportunities do we have for saving some money on taxes now by reducing our taxable income? and putting, putting away this money for long-term retirement goals. So one of the first things we're gonna look at is a SEP IRA. And that's because SEP IRAs have higher contribution limits than traditional for or traditional IRAs or Roth IRAs. Um, and that specifically is based on 25% of net income. So that's your contribution limit on a SEP IRA. I do want to point out that if you're paying yourself a W-2 because you've elected uh, to be treated as an S corporation, then that 25% limit is applied to the W-2 income. So that is a restriction on that. 
The other limit is you cannot go over and above the $66,000 limit on contributions to retirement plans, which is the 2023 limit set by the uh, by I, excuse me the IRS that changes every year. It's adjusted, and uh, so this year it just happens to be 66,000. So you also have to be lower than that. What we really like about SEP IRAs for new business owners is there is maximum flexibility. A SEP IRA has uh, a lot of often a lot of the same types of uh, investment options that you'd have within a traditional IRA that you might go set up with any given brokerage firm. Um, so you can choose, you know, which brokerage you open this with, and that's going to give you, uh, you know, the investment options based on whichever firm you happen to be working with. You can also work with an advisor and they can talk to you about what it would look like for them to manage this account for you, if that's a good fit. Um, but in any case, there's good flexibility here. The fees are low. Um, the administrative costs are usually tied to, you know, whatever internal fees you have for managing or administering the account, which are generally very low, much lower than, say, setting up a 401k or solo 401k account. And it doesn't rely on you maintaining a certain level of contribution. If you have $12,000 available to contribute this year, you can contribute that. It's tax deferred. So uh, you're reducing your taxable income by every dollar that you put into that account for this year. And you don't have to withdraw that. But you know, once you withdraw that money uh, in retirement, you pay taxes at that time. And so you can be intentional to choose you know, how much you're withdrawing at any given time and, and pay taxes on that amount as you need it. So the idea here is if you're earning a lot now, and you're in a high marginal tax bracket, you can reduce your taxable income, put this money in here. And this offers you ultimate flexibility where some of the more some of the other retirement account options we're going to talk about today have some additional restrictions where you have to make specific sequential types of contributions. Well, you have a question here about uh, what if you have one employee who's your spouse? Are SEPs a good fit for that? Can you talk a little bit about uh that family member employee. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I haven't worked with a client specifically that, that set up a SEP IRA and has had a, a, a employee, you know, a family member employee contribute to that. Um, I'd have to look into and just make sure that that's definitely okay. I know for sure that solo 401ks, if you have a spouse, um, they can participate in the solo 401k, which is a nice carve out. Uh, so as long as they're completing ancillary uh you know, work within the business and earn income from the business, they can contribute that income to a solo 401k. All right, let's go ahead and move on. In our example, our client has grown their business. They've nearly doubled their net income. So now they're up to $150,000. They're coming into us and now they have $25,000 to contribute to a retirement account. And this is where uh, we may go uh, to the next level. You know, they did a step in year one. We didn't know exactly where the business was headed. Now in year two, they're excited about putting more money into retirement accounts and they see a growth trajectory. They think at minimum, we know we're going to be contributing $25,000 a year into the future. Excuse me, into the future. And so now we're looking at what opportunities do we have to save you or rather contribute even more to uh, your retirement accounts. So with an eye towards the future, this client's coming in and having a discussion about uh, whether a solo K is a good plan for them. And solo K just means 401k that's just for an individual or sole proprietor. Um, in this case, uh, and in fact, most of the solo Ks that we open, we have, uh, we have opened them with an idea of what that business plans to do in the future. And that's really important when you talk to your advisor to give them some context about where you want to go with your business so that they can help you consider what features are important in a 401k. Some of the things that we look at, if you're going to be an individual business owner and not hire any employees into the future, then we may not be as worried about the user interface or the types of features that are going to encourage your employees to get actively involved in saving for their own retirement, because we're just worried about an efficient retirement account for you, the business owner. 
on the, the flip side of that, if you plan on bringing in many, many employees, um, you want them to be able to retire and you want to be able to put in uh, money into their retirement accounts to meet your safe harbor matching requirements uh, and encourage them to do the same and, and save for retirement. So maybe the user interface is a more important aspect of that. Um, so these are the kinds of things to talk about, just as a couple examples of considerations when you're opening a 401k. The other things would be, you know, what investment options does that third-party administrator or platform have available to you? And how involved is your advisor going to be in this process? So is your advisor going to be engaging with your employees on an annual basis, encouraging them to sign up, showing them how they might sign up, and meeting that responsibility of, you know, administrating and advising on that account? Or is that going to be largely up to you? because of, uh, you know, what that role, how the advisor sees their role. So make sure you're asking those questions when you talk to a financial professional about facilitating a 401k for you. I want to say something before we go on from this slide um, and just mention, I, I threw out the term safe harbor match. Um, it's important that I mention that uh, there's a federal law that regulates retirement accounts. It's called ERISA. And basically it was signed into law to protect the individual participants of employer-sponsored retirement plans. And one of the key requirements of ERISA is that if you have a participatory retirement plan, uh, you have to offer a safe harbor match in order to you yourself as a business owner make contributions to this plan at the level that you, uh, you see fit. So there's two kind of uh, standard safe harbor match options. The first is that you as the employer offer 100% match on the first 3% of contributions from an employee, and then 50% match on the next 2% of contributions. I really like this one if you're a business owner who's trying to encourage their employees to maximize their retirement savings, because it's an incentive for them not only to put in that first 3% and get that match on that, but then stretch up to, to contributing 5% total of their salary. And if they do that, they're getting another 4% from you. So right out of the gate, just by maximizing their company match, they're putting in 9% of their salary into a retirement plan. And that might actually give them a leg up and give them a chance to, to develop some meaningful retirement savings. So that's a great benefit. That's a really competitive uh, you know, place to be in terms of trying to retain and attract talent. The other option that's standard is uh, a flat 100% uh, match on the first 4% of contributions. And I think that for some, uh, just talk to your advisor, because in some cases, that can be a really good fit, especially if your workforce is less inclined to maximize or take advantage of any kind of due incentive. Um, they may instead, you know, be able to just afford two or three uh, percent of their salary to put in towards this account or decide that that's all that they can do. And this is a way of maximizing how much you're contributing dollar for dollar to their plan. So both are good options. It really just depends on your situation. We're going to get into some of the numbers of uh, what it looks like to open up a solo 401k or 401k. And uh, from this slide, you know, going forward, we're really going to to dive into some of the specifics of how much money you might be able to put into one of these accounts as you start to grow your business and have excess funds available to put into retirement accounts. Um, so in either case, solo K or 401k, uh, you as the employee, or, or rather I should say all employees, uh, have contribution limits of 22,500 up to age 50. Over age 50, there's a $7,500 catch-up provision so those employees can contribute $30,000 this year. Those numbers are adjusted by the IRS every year. So consult a planner or a CPA to know what those numbers are. And then going back to what I said about how as an employer, you have much uh, broader range of opportunities to save additional funds into retirement. When you set up a 401k, you can opt for a profit sharing plan as part of this program. And so going back to the visual of a bucket where you can make employee and employer contributions, oh, thanks, Marche. That contribution 
of 22,500 is the employee side, but on the employer side, you can engage in a profit sharing plan. And it has its own set of safe harbor requirements. Specifically, any employee, uh, if you're going to open and operate a profit sharing plan, needs to receive 6% of their salary into the profit sharing plan. Now you have discretion over how much you put into those accounts, but to meet your safe harbor match requirement, you need to put 6% into any, uh, any and all employees accounts, except for your highly compensated individuals. So any employees that make over this year, it's 150,000 are considered highly compensated individuals. Um, you do not need to meet that 6% match requirement. Um, but for you, because you have discretion over this account, as long as you meet your safe harbor requirement of 6% to non-highly compensated individuals, you yourself can contribute up to 43,500, which if you're following the math, adds up between that and the 225 to your maximum of 66,000 into retirement accounts. So that's what we get really excited about when we're talking to employers, because now they've gone from uh, whatever their employee may have offered them plus their IRA opportunity. So at maximum, you know, we were before only able to put in something like $29,000 as an employee into tax advantage retirement accounts. And now right out of the gate, if we set up this account, we can get up to $66,000. So this really works well for folks that have high cash flows and want to reduce their tax bill now and choose when to pay taxes on that money later on in retirement. So you can see here, we got excited about the illustration. We put in how much money you might save in taxes if you maxed out your contributions in that given year. And uh, depending on your state tax rate, that could be a huge incentive too. If you have a high state income tax, uh, you know that's, that's just all the more in savings in that year. I want to point out in this specific example, um, you know, we just came up with an estimate based on a conversation with our third-party administrator who facilitates some of these accounts. So for a, for a participatory 401k, where you have employees engaging and participating in the plan, uh, a typical admin cost you could expect to be around $1,000 a year. And then that 1.2% is an estimate of 1% for uh, paying your advisor to manage the funds within that account and manage the plan and then 0.2% to the 401k administrator company for an ongoing administrative fee. And that's on assets within the plan. So that's going to vary based on the size of the plan, uh, the, um, the platform and the administrator that you're working with, and the advisor and what their advisory fee is on that. So make sure you're asking for a comprehensive list of fees when you're having this discussion about opening a plan. All right, one year later, our business owner is now doing really well. They have half a million in net income. Um, same as before, they want to contribute $25,000 into their own retirement account, but maybe they're identifying cash flow over and above that that they want to try to save. So this is when we're going to start talking about opening a profit sharing um, plan within that 401k. And then we're also going to talk about a cash balance plan, which we haven't mentioned yet, but if you meet your obligations under ERISA for participatory 401k and it's in service and you've met your safe harbor requirement of offering 6% uh, in profit sharing to your employees besides your highly compensated individuals, then you can go above and beyond that and make additional savings into your, these retirement accounts in the form of a cash balance plan. Now this is separate but related to and reliant on an operational 401k. So the cash balance plan has to be in conjunction with a 401k plan. And I think on the next slide, we illustrate uh, how much we can save on that. Okay, so here it mentions the safe harbor provision. Uh, again, that's 6% into a profit sharing plan. And then you also need to contribute. If you put a cash balance plan in place, Every employee needs to get a, a, a certain minimal amount uh, into their own cash balance plan to meet the testing requirements uh, under ERISA. Um, but an example that's been given to me by one of our third-party administrators is in most cases, this can be $1,000 a year. And we'll show you in the next slide that it can be a lot more for the business owner. 
You want to talk about that new comparability test before we move on to the 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 grid here? Um, no, I think we just go into the grid. Okay. So this is based on actuarial tables. Um, it's tied to, uh, and, and that's what that test is about. So it's tied to uh, your age and what you earn within the company. And so when you work with uh, a 401k administrative firm, they'll often have their own actuary who will help you establish how much can be paid out based on your age and your earnings within the company. And so these are maximums within these ranges. And it's important to note that to meet the test for a cash balance plan, one of the requirements is you need to be, you need to contribute to this in consistent amounts for at least the first three years, unless you have a legitimate reason for shutting down the plan. And the reason for that is this is intended, like all other retirement plans, to help people save for retirement. Um, and uh, as far as we can tell, you know, we just the IRS wants to make sure this isn't being manipulated to be used for like a high earning year. It has to instead be used consistently over time to help you save for those long-term retirement goals. Um, but for our business owners, uh, there's often times that, you know, business owners have put capital into their business over time. And so now that they're earning profits in their business, there's an opportunity for them to put money into these tax advantaged accounts and save it for those long-term retirement goals. So it can be a good fit for our high earning business owners who have excess cash flow to put into their retirement accounts. And you can see here on the, the right-hand side, um, the really impressive numbers when you talk about how much you're reducing your taxable obligation for the year. All right. So in our example, now um, our business owner has more than tripled their net income and they're going to owe a lot on taxes. So this is a great example of where a cash balance plan makes really good sense for a business owner. You know, they're trying to reduce the amount they're paying at their highest marginal tax rate. And when they do that, they choose to defer the taxes on those balances. They're putting it into their retirement accounts. And then once they retire, they can choose how much they draw from those accounts every year until, of course, they hit 72 and they have required minimum distributions. And so that's something that you want to, want to make sure you have a conversation with your CPA and or financial advisor to determine um, you know, what your obligation will be in RMDs in the future. So you can plan that out. We map those things out for clients all the time. And uh, this is all about being intentional. So we're minimizing our lifetime tax obligation and so that we have the income that we need for our retirement goals. So make sure you're having those conversations as you plan for the future and put things together like 401ks and cash balance plans. In this example, you know, going back to that chart, even if you're 35, you can put over 150,000 into the owner's retirement plan. Um, if you chose, you could max out the profit sharing. So that's where that 43,500 comes from. You could uh, decide that you want to compensate your executives with tax advantaged funds into their profit sharing plan. So if you chose to do that, you could go up to the $43,500 limit. That would, if they were already maxing out their 22,500 employee contribution, that would max out their, their total that could go into a plan as well. So just something to consider. If you wanted to, you could go that high, but note again, if they're highly compensated, over 150,000 in income, you do not have to contribute to their profit sharing plan. And if they make less than that, um, the 6% barrier is the safe harbor threshold. Um, I think this is our last slide on this topic. So it ends kind of uh, with a cheesy note here. The result is we've got happier employees, a uh, happy employer, and you've paid money to your employees instead of the IRS. So, uh, you know, our goal here again is intentionality. It's about choosing how much we pay and win in taxes. And it's about uh, you know, maximizing what we can save for our long-term retirement goals. So uh, this is just scratched the surface. I know we've only touched on this really high level. So uh, please engage a financial advisor if you have questions about how this works. And my, my hope is that 
uh, we've shed some light on the, the great benefits that you get from being a business owner and the opportunities that are out there for you to, one, save money on taxes, and two, put away additional funds in tax-advantaged retirement accounts for your long-term goals. Um, it's really exciting when I get to sit down with a business owner and have this discussion because uh, a lot of folks just are used to being in an employee world and they're not aware of the opportunities available as an employer. Very, very neat. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a frog in my throat there. Um, we'll go ahead and open the floor up for some questions and I've already gathered some. So those of you who are uh, who might have some more questions, go ahead and put those in the chat and happy to add them to my list here. Uh, the question is, how hard is it to set up something like a SEP IRA? And then maybe can you talk about, you know, um, how hard it is maybe to set up a, a solo 401k? So someone who's maybe a sole proprietor looking for that. Yeah, you can go out and set up a SEP IRA on your own. Um, I recommend at, at minimum, talk to your CPA about how much you should be contributing because they're going to determine your net income. And if, like I said, if you made the S corp election, you have further restrictions on how much you can contribute. So you don't want to be hit with a tax penalty because you over contributed to a, a, a SEP IRA. But um, yeah, I, I definitely know people who have gone out and set them up themselves with, uh, you know, one of the online brokerage firms and decided that they were going to self-manage those accounts. So very doable, um, similar to setting up your own IRA at a brokerage firm. Um, otherwise, if you engage an advisor, they'll be more than happy to set one up for you. So Separately, it's pretty easy. You can do it at any time of the year. Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I believe, yes. But uh, what year the contribution is credited to depends on uh, when you file taxes. So mm. again, talk to your CPA. If you're trying, a lot of times, you know, business owners will not really know what their net income was until the, the tax return comes back. And so make sure that you have that conversation with your tax preparer about your plan to contribute to a SEP IRA so you can determine what your net income was, what is the right amount for you personally to contribute to a SEP IRA, and then make that contribution before you file taxes for that tax year. All right. And then I know that there are some restrictions on setting up a 401k as far as timing goes. It's not a, something you can go into your advisor's office and say, okay, I want a 401k. I know it's a process. Can you walk through kind of like a, that timeline and maybe a little bit about what kind of information you need? Sure. Yeah. So you're going to have to talk to an advisor. Um, they're going to set one up and facilitate that for you. There are some shops that I think specialize in kind of a, a no frills, uh, easy to get set up retirement plan. You know, I know uh, more and more I'm seeing even payroll service companies like uh, some of the the uh, software as a service companies that offer online payroll. They um, integrate and work with advisors that specialize in setting up these plans. So they'll be able to tell you what information they need. Uh, for setting up your business, but specifically they're, they're looking for, you know, what kind of revenue do you have as a business? How many employees do you have now? And how many do you, do you plan to have in the future? Um, what employees do we need to get enrolled in this plan? And what's our obligation for uh, open enrollment? You know, when should that be? And so usually it's a couple months before the end of the year that they, any given year, that they need to have that information if you want to get it set up for that tax year. Um, but the earlier in the year you can start planning for this and get it ready, uh, the more leeway you're going to have to help your employees um, get up and running with the plan and start making contributions for the current tax year. So as far as um, having your 401k set up at your business, what sort of education uh, requirements do you have to educate your employees about contributing to their retirement plan? Um, yeah, it's important that uh, you have an annual meeting. And a lot of times if you're working with an advisor, that advisor will do that. Make sure you're having a conversation with your 401k administrator so that you know that you're meeting your legal obligations uh, in terms of educating your employees about the plan and that you're meeting your requirements for open enrollment opportunities 
and that you're not otherwise overly restricting their opportunity to get invested in the 401k. It's not uncommon for there, there to be a waiting period. I think 180 days is coming to mind as, as a typical kind of waiting period to get involved and invested in a 401k. Um, but definitely, you know, talk to your plan administrator to make sure that all of the plan documents uh, lay out um, what those requirements are and that you're sharing that when you hire new employees. So they get that paperwork. They know when they can expect to participate in a plan. Um, but that's going to vary based on you know what what your specific needs are as a company, what types of you know employees you're hiring, and for what responsibilities. Um, so make sure you're having that discussion and getting clear answers from your advisor for your situation about uh, you know how to establish that plan and how to have those meetings. I know for the plans with multiple employees that we institute, we do um, at the very least as the advisor, we come in and do a presentation to the employees that everyone has an opportunity to participate in and ask questions at. And then we encourage individual employees to come and consult with us if they have questions about the plan options. And I know at firms I've been, been at before that offered 401ks, um, usually that's the case that the advisor will at least give a brief presentation about what's available and uh, then offer themselves up to the individual employees to answer any further questions. So um, if your advisor is not offering that, you know, ask them why. You know, have that conversation uh, and make sure that they are, you know, engaging your employees and, uh, you know, doing their due diligence and explaining how the plan works. Very interesting. And then one last question here. Uh, someone asked what advantage it is to putting uh, so much of your money in retirement when you could maybe grow your business and sell that business for a greater amount. So can you talk about uh, that kind of push and pull between growing the business versus uh, building your own nest egg outside of the business? Yeah, you know, that's a conversation that we're always excited to have with potential clients. Um, we're weighing the tax savings of putting money into retirement accounts versus how that, what that money might do in the business if you reinvest in it. Um, to be clear, you know, this conversation today, especially when we talk about the cash balance plan and maximizing retirement savings uh, is really most relevant to folks that have uh, excessive cash flow and are trying to reduce their overall taxable burden um, by contributing to these types of accounts and saving that money again for long-term use. Um, and frankly, you know, here's, here's another way of looking at it. Uh, the IRS restriction that you get a 10% tax penalty for withdrawing funds from these accounts before age 59 and a half means that if you're a 60 year old business owner and you're contributing to these funds, you can start to withdraw those immediately. So it's thinking about where are you in the life cycle of your business and what makes sense for you? Because, uh, of course, if you're 30 years old, and you need to be investing back in the business, it's going to be a long time before you can access those funds without a 10% tax penalty at 59 and a half. So your situation is going to be a lot different than if you're 60 years old and your considerations about um, not only your business, but also how you want to spend the rest of your life are going to be very different. Well, really interesting stuff. I'm afraid we don't have much more time today with our uh, speaker, but I want to thank you, Brandon, for being here, and I want to thank the organizations that have made this webinar possible to today. To our attendees, I know we have covered a lot, but we have recorded this webinar, and we will be sending you a link to the replay of this event. You're welcome to rewatch it, share it with friends or family or coworkers or uh, people in your business who need to be educated about this. It's a good primer for this topic. On behalf of Advice Chaser, we want to thank you again for coming. We're all about helping you find a financial advisor who's a great fit for your life and your financial questions. Our matching service is free to you, and every one of our advisor partners has committed to offer a free initial consultation to anyone we introduce them to. Find out more by going to advicechaser.com and clicking on the link to find an advisor. Well, once again, from Advice Chaser, thank you everyone for coming, and we hope to see you at another webinar soon. Goodbye, everyone.